Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kyrian. Today, we will study 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we will be talking about the rapture of the church today. If you missed any of our previous studies, you can always go to our website. That website is kuim.org or you can go to our YouTube or SoundCloud channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. All our teachings are posted online and you can download them at your own convenience. Uh, before we continue, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, your children, we've gathered this morning again to glean from your word. Father, we pray that you will speak to us through your word today. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Dear Spirit of God, I pray that you will open the eyes of our understanding, that you will minister to us simultaneously this morning, that you will give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of the scriptures. Not only that you will give us understanding, but also that you will give us the ability to be doers of the word of God. As we live in the world that is bombarded every day through uh, social media, internet, and all kind of stuff, we ask you, Holy Spirit, the strength, the ability to be able to separate ourselves from this world. For even though we are in this world, we are not of this world. Heavenly Father, as the rapture of the church is imminent, we pray that you will help us. That you will help us to live a life that is in accordance with the expectation of the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the trumpet will sound and all of us will be changed. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. But unto your name we give praise, glory, honor and thanksgiving for everything that you've done for us and you will continue to do. We say, blessed be thy holy name. In Jesus' name, and everybody say the amen. Welcome, my good friends. Today, we will continue our study to the First Thessalonians chapter 4. The letter to Thessalonians was written by Paul, and he wrote this letter from Corinth. It was written about 50 to 51 AD, and uh, it is believed to be Paul's first epistle. It is an eschatological epistle because as we will see today, it will talk about the rapture of the church. You remember Paul and Silas during their second missionary journey uh, they, 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 when they got to um, Dobi, uh, Timothy joined them there. And uh, they wanted to go to Asia and uh, Britannia, but the Spirit of God forbade them. Later, Paul had a vision. In that vision, he saw a man who said, come to Macedonia and help us. So they went to Macedonia the first place they visited was Philippi, and they got into so much trouble there. Someone will say, why did they get in trouble if they were called by God to go into Macedonia? As Christians, persecution is inevitable. The difference is the persecutions will come, but the strength to overcome the persecutions will be there by the power of the Holy Ghost. So they were beaten in Philippi and they were thrown into jail. The next day, when they got out, they left the city and they went to Thessalonica. Thessalonica, they were there for three Sabbath days, which is about three weeks or at most four weeks. Paul reasoned in the, in the synagogue with the Jews and they telling them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. At some point, he got them upset. So they ran him out of town. From there, they went to Buria, 
and the same trouble came up again so they left Berea and went to Athens now while in Athens Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to go and uh, establish this new convert and also to encourage them while he proceeded to uh, Corinth with uh, Luke and uh, and uh, and Silas while he was uh, in Corinth Timothy came back and he brought him good news about uh, the progress these uh, new converts were making so Paul wrote them this letter to clarify certain things that Timothy found out. Paul was there only for a short period of time. So there were some things that he needed to give them more details. So he wrote this letter to classify uh, so many things. We're going to go ahead and we'll start. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to work and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. If you remember the last chapter, um, the last verse of chapter 3, we covered that last week. Uh, towards the end, Paul prayed that God will establish their hearts, blameless in holiness, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, in the light of this, in the light of their expectation of the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul now beseeched them, or in other words, begged them to live a life that is holy. Now, what does holiness mean? Holiness is the root, the, the word in, um, uh, in Greek is hegios. It means to be separated, to be sanctified for the use of God. Remember, Israel, we are separated from the Egyptians. God called them out from the midst of the Egyptians, separated unto him for his own glory and for his own work. Paul exhorts them here to live a life that is holy. The, a life that is separated completely to God himself for his own use and for his own purpose. A life of a Christian. That's what he's calling them here to live. Because the rapture is eminent. It's going to happen anytime. The reason why God created you and I, we can see this in Revelation chapter 4. If we read verse 8, the four living creatures in heaven, John saw this revelation. The four living creatures in heaven, day and night, they do not cease to Worship God to give him glory to praise him. And they will say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And now the 24 elders, 
will cast their crown upon the throne of God and they will say, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power for you created all things for your good pleasure. They are and they were created. So you see, the purpose of God creating you and I is for his own good pleasure. The thing that, the thing that will please him. For fellowship, kononia, for oneness. This is the reason why God created you and I. Jesus Christ is a very good example of this. As he tells us, he says, I always do those things that please my father, even though he is God. But because he became man, just like you and I, he gives us the example. He says, I always do those things that please my father. In the Old Testament, God says, be you holy. Because I am holy, be you separate unto me. I am a jealous God. I've called you out of this uh, darkness into my own marvelous light. I don't want you to be partakers of what the hidden are doing. Partakers of what the world, the world, the people in the world, what they are doing. I don't want you to be part of this. I want you to know now that you've been purchased with a price. Now I want you to glorify me in your flesh and in your spirits, which now they belong to me. This is what God is calling you and I to do. Now, in the light of uh, this holiness, Paul will narrow it down now. He narrows it down to one section for now. That section is fornication. He, he wants them to, be, to abstain from fornication. Now, the word fornication is uh, pornea. That's a Greek word. From where we get the word pornography. It means any sexual immorality outside the context of marriage. And marriage is defined as a covenant between a man and a woman. Governed by the laws of God. So, so many people, they have come up with so many names to these sexual immoralities. They have given them fancy names so that they can be acceptable to the society. But remember that the laws of God will always precede the laws of men. So we, we don't go by what people think. We don't go by the names, the coin. We go by what does the word of God say about this. So he warns them from fornication. To stay away from fornication. Now remember that uh, God originated sex. Yes. But anything that is originated by God must be governed by God. So he has his own rules and regulation. And his own prescribed order is between a man and a woman married. Who are under a covenant. What happens when you, you commit fornication or, adult, or adultery or whatever name you want to give it? Any sexual immorality is this. When you got born again, your body became the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved in you. So now... Your body is no longer your own body. You were purchased at that point with a price. And God wants you to glorify him now in your own body and in your own spirit. The Bible says those that are joined with the Lord, they are one spirit with him. How shall you then join the temple of the Holy Spirit with a harlot or somebody else? That is not your spouse. You see, every sin a man or a woman commits is outside his own body. But a sin of fornication or adultery or, adultery or a, a sexual immorality is against your own body. So this is why 
Paul want, he wants them to abstain from any sexual immorality. He wants us not to live like Gentiles. You know, to Gentiles, when they commit fornication, they, they say they are making love. <laughs> That's the term they use, you know. So they give, they've given it so many names just to make it acceptable. To that one who is not yet born again is spiritually dead. By nature, they are children of wrath. For them, they don't have any choice. They sin because they have a sin nature. They have not been called out of darkness. So he wants us not to go their own way, not to emulate their lifestyle. But he calls us to be what? Holy, sanctified unto God. So now, as he tells them to abstain from sexual immorality, he also warns them not to take advantage of anyone in this area. We have people, unfortunately, in churches today who are there to lure other people to sexual immorality because they are maybe superior in the church or they have uh, a better advantage over others, they will lure them into sexual sins in the church. Even pastors, even ministers. It is so sad because when you do this to a, someone in the church, it has two consequences. Number one, most often, you will cause them to, over, to be overthrown, their faith. Some of them will go into regrets. They will have condemnation within themselves. And oftentimes, they will backslide because they will say, if a brother or a sister should do this to me, what do I, what do I care about going to that place? So you will cause them to stumble. Secondly, it is a sin against God. It is wickedness in the church, inside the church. You may think that God doesn't see. Or nobody knows. Because it was done in the secret. But remember what the Bible says. All things are naked and open in the eyes of him whom we have to do it. All things are naked in his presence. He sees everything. David in Psalm 139 says, Where will I go from your presence? Where will I flee from your spirit? If I send into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the hell, he says, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and uh, ascend to the utmost part of the sea, he says, even there shall your hand lead me and the right hand shall hold me. He says everything. He says, vengeance is mine for I will repair. Do not be mocked. For God, do not be deceived. For God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he says, he shall reap. It is not only talking about taking advantage of people where sexual immorality is consigned, but in other areas in the church. When you finish doing business with, a, with brethren, what would they think about you and who you represent, which is Jesus Christ? You cheat them when you do business with them. You lie to them. Do you malign their names? Whatever we do, the Bible tells us, in words or in deed, we should do them to the glory of the Father Almighty. The things that are pleasing to God is what he's calling us here to do.
Now, let me separate, let me make a, a, a statement here. Someone would ask, why are we doing, doing, doing? Paul is talking about doing, doing, doing here. Remember, Paul is not talking about the root of salvation. He's not talking about uh, your salvation here. What is he talking about? Because in salvation, it is by grace through faith. It's not because of your works, your special efforts. It's not about the thing you do. You don't do anything to end salvation. It's a free gift. God gave it to you through Jesus Christ. But what Paul is talking about here is the fruit of your salvation. After you get, after you are born again, the Holy Spirit of God now moves in you, and He enables you to live a life, a life that is formed to the image of Christ. So James tells us that faith without works is dead completely. If you are really born again, that faith that you use when you got born again is supposed to be a fruit. Fruit of righteousness which can be seen in the way you live your life. So this is what Paul is talking about here. He's not talking about your salvation, how we get born again. He's talking about after you get born again, the life that you expected to live. For if we, by the Spirit of God, do modify the deed of the flesh, we can live this type of life. It is not by might. It's not, it's not going to be by your own power. But the Spirit of God in you will be able, who is the one who will enable you to live this kind of life. Now we continue in verse 9. It says, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So here Paul commends them for walking in love towards God and towards one another. But he didn't stop there. He exhorts them to abound more and more. So the question is this. Can you get to the point that you will say, I have arrived in love. <laughs> I have all the love it takes now. No, no, we can't. It is a process. It is a journey. That's why he tells them, he tells them here to abound more and more. He says there is room for improvement. He says you cannot say that I have arrived. I cannot count myself to have apprehended, Paul says. Remember that love is a fruit of your recreated spirit. We say this in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, where it tells us that the fruit of the spirit is love. And then it gives you the characteristics of uh, that love. Peace, joy, meekness, uh, gentleness, uh, temperance, and all that. Because it is a fruit, you can always increase it can always abound. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He says, if any abides in me and I abide in him, same shall bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. As long as you abide in Christ Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you're going to continue to grow in love. Remember, the love of Christ is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It is not going to be by your own strength that you're going to love. But the fruit is there. By the power of the Holy Ghost, you can grow every day. The mistake that most of us make 
sometimes is this. We depend on our own selves. So then we struggle to love. Even, even when we know that we cannot love that one who has offended us, who has persecuted us, who has cheated us, who has given us so much trouble. But instead, of, instead, of, instead for us to go boldly to God in prayers and ask him for the strength to be able to love that one. And we are trying to fake it. So we can only love by the power of the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit of God that's going to empower you and I to be able to love. You see, in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ quoted from the Old Testament. In um, Leviticus and also in Deuteronomy, he says the commandment of God, all the commandments, he says, is summarized in two laws. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And he says the second is just like that. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he went further and said, you shall love your neighbor as I have loved you. How much is the love of Christ to us? He gave us everything he got. This is how much he loved us. And then he even went further and said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Those who spitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. This is what God wants us to do when it comes to love. He says, by this shall men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And this is the kind of love that God has for us. We call it agape love. Not the emotional love. Not the fleshy love. This is the love we call the unconditional love of God. The love that gives. The love that endures all hopes all, believes all things. The love that will never fail. The love of Christ. The love that is not envious. That is always seeking for justice to be done. This is the kind of love that is calling them here to abound even more and more and more. And as Christians, I have given you the key. You got to depend in the power of the Holy Ghost to be able to love this way. It is possible because the Spirit of God is in you to empower you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Now we proceed. In verse 11, it says, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. To mind your own business and to work with your own hands. As we commanded you. That you may work properly towards those who are outside. And that you may lack nothing. So what is he saying here? Remember Paul told them earlier that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was imminent or is imminent because it's still imminent today. It happened any time. He told them. So because of this reason, many of them became busy bodies, lazy bodies. They didn't want to do anything now. They're depending on other people. So he tells them the here, he says, don't be lazy. Get out and do something. Get busy. Put your hand into something. God got to see you put your hand into something to bless it. He cannot bless nothing. But when you put your hand into something, God will multiply it. 
We see it in the parable where, where Jesus fed those uh, fed the 5,000 people. And also in the 7,000 people. He had something to lay his hands on. There gotta be something God is gonna walk with. Do not go praying every day, God bless me, bless me, oh God. Then you pray and you fast. Oh, bless me, oh Lord. And you don't wanna do anything? What is God gonna bless? He says, whatever you lay your hands shall prosper. What are you laying your hands upon? There got to be something for him to bless. This is true. So he tells them not to be busy bodies. Jesus says, occupy till I come. I'm coming back. But when I'm gone, I want you to be busy. If any will not work, let him not eat. The Bible tells us. He said, let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him walk with his own hands. Doing that which is good. So that he will have something to bless other people with. This is the purpose we got to work. That we have something to bless other people. Something to use in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Something that we can use to further the progress of the kingdom of God on earth. You are not doing somebody any good if you are supporting them when they deliberately don't want to work. Are you hearing me, my friends? You're not doing any good to them. If it is someone who is searching for the work, for a job, they are actively looking. Yes, give them all the help they need, for they need it. We are called to help one another. But not when somebody has made up their mind willingly to be busy bodies. Some say that I don't mind is the devil's workshop. But this is true because its origin is biblical in Proverbs. So Paul tells them, he says, occupy. <laughs> Do not be lazy bodies. He says, put your hands into something. Contribute. You know, don't sit down and try to depend on others 100%. No. <laughs> he said, God will bless the work of your hands. When you put your hand into something genuine, <laughs> he will bless you. You will be like a tree planted by the side of rivers of many waters. <laughs> you will always bear fruit and all that you do will prosper. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 13. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring him, will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be corrupt together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hmm. Now we are now getting into a very, very important topic in Christendom. The rapture of the church. Here, Paul Remember, he was 
in Thessalonica for about a month at most. But it is amazing how much he loaded them up within this one month he was there. He gave them the basics. And not only that, he started the feeding with a, a, a strong meat. <laughs> but he needed more time to give them details. So there were some areas he didn't give them details. Part of the reason why he sent Timothy to go and establish them and encourage them. And this is one of the areas here. So he writes back to them just to clarify this area of the rapture of the church. Because he told them that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was imminent. Some of them died after he told them that. So they were worried and they were like, oh, they're going to miss out now on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom here on earth. They were worried. They said they're going to they, they, they're gonna miss out on all these glorious things that's going to happen at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul tells them here now, He writes to them here, trying to explain this thing to them. So he wants them not to sorrow. He wants them not to think that these ones who died or who fall asleep. He wants them to know that these ones are not lost. That they are in the presence of the Lord Almighty. Because the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, when this our earthly tabernacle or tent is dissolved, we have a building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Sometimes the Bible will use the word asleep to depict physical death. Uh, we see this example when Lazarus died. Jesus told his disciples that Lazarus was asleep. Now, there are different types of death that the Bible talks about. And I'm going to go through some of them briefly. Because we don't have uh, enough time in this uh, program today. First of all is the physical death, which is what Paul is talking about here now. Those people were consigned about those who have already died physically. Now, physical death is the separation of a man's consciousness or his spirit from his own body. When the spirit of a man or a woman leaves the body, the body falls back to the dust. That is why we say to be absent from the body is to be present with, the, with, with, with God. So the spirit leaves the body. It has two locations. It goes up if they are born again to God, the creator. Or it goes to hell if they are not born again. This is physical death. Everyone born in this world will go through physical death. Except Christians who are alive when the rapture of the church happens, they will not go through physical death. The second type is spiritual death. Now, spiritual death is the separation of a man's spirit from the spirit of God. Everyone who is born into this earth goes through spiritual death first. It is something that we inherited from Adam and Eve. You didn't do anything to go into this state. This is how you were born. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The soul that sins, it shall die. The Bible tells us. For the wages of sin is death. 
So when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they entered into spiritual death, which is the separation of their spirit from the spirit of God. So anyone who is not born again today is already dead spiritually. But the moment you get born again, that day you come out of spiritual death. And you will never again die spiritual death. How do I know this? The Bible tells us. Jesus tells us. Because in the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, he says, though he were dead, yet he shall live. And he that lives and believes shall never die. And he says, do you believe this matter? So he says, he that believes will never die. What is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about spiritual death. He says, if you believe, the moment you come to Christ, you will never again die spiritually. That is why when a Christian dies, all they did was they checked out. They moved from this earth to another location. A glorious thing. Another type of death is uh, second death. The Bible talks about second death. Now, second death is the death which anyone who went through the spiritual death will go this second death. Inevitable. And it tells us when it will happen. At the white throne judgment of God. In Revelation, the Bible tells us, both the, both the small and great appears in the presence of God. And it says the books were opened. And then another book was opened. And the people were judged based on the things which were written in that book. And if anyone was found with his name not written in the Lamb's book of life, he says that one was cast into Gehenna. Gehenna is the final destination, which is the second death. They will be cast into Gehenna. And outer darkness, Jesus describes it this way. So this is the second death. It is so glorious, a thing of excitement, that you and I, believers in Christ Jesus, we will never go into spiritual death. Neither shall we go into the second death. For Christ Jesus has already redeemed us from all of this. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he tells them, he says, do not sorrow like those who have no hope. He says, when a Christian dies, all he did was to leave his earthly tabernacle. That body that is weak old, with disease. He says that body, he leaves that body. And then he goes in the presence of God Almighty. So when someone dies who is a Christian, we don't grieve for them. Are you hearing me? Now God gave us the, the, the tears in our eyes and he, he gave us emotions so we have the ability to grieve. But he's telling us here that we don't grieve like those without hope. Let me tell you the reason why people grieve when someone dies. They grieve for themselves. If it's a Christian, you are grieving for yourself. You are grieving because you're going to miss them. You're going to miss their company. You're going to miss the things they were doing for you before they died. That's what you are grieving for. You're not grieving for someone who is in a better place than you, who is in the presence of Almighty God. Why would you grieve for such a person? But when someone who is not a Christian dies, do you know what happens? You can grieve for them because they are lost forever. Now they are in hell. So this is the difference. We don't grieve like those who don't have any hope. Because our hope is in the Lord God, Jesus Christ forever and ever. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul will tell us here how this will happen. The rapture of the church. 
How is it going to happen? Remember, he's writing to uh, uh, the saints at Thessalonica to clarify these gray areas that they needed more revelation. So now he's going to tell them how this whole thing is going to unfold. So he says that the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the rapture of the church, and there are people who say the rapture is not a word in the Bible. Yes, so many translations, you would not see that word rapture. But if you read the Latin Vogueth, translated by Jerome, uh, around 400, um, um, around 400 AD, you will see that, um, you, you will see that the word rapture is there. And, and, uh, and, um, The word rapture in Greek, the word is hapazo. It means to seize by force. It means to snatch by force. So it tells us here that um, all of a sudden, it could be tomorrow. Could be next tomorrow, it could be next year, we don't know. It is all of a sudden the Lord Himself is gonna descend from heaven with a shout. He says, with a voice of an archangel, with a trumpet of God. So, what he's saying here, he says, the voice of Jesus is gonna sound like a trumpet. We see this in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Paul on the day of the Lord, John on the day of the Lord. He was caught up in that vision and, uh, and he had a voice that said unto him, I am the Alpha and Omega. And when he turned behind to see who was talking to him, he saw someone as like the son of man walking in the midst of seven candlesticks. So the voice of Jesus here sounded like a trumpet. He says the voice is going to sound like a trumpet. And now he tells you what's going to happen. He says, Jesus will come with those ones who have died. The ones who have fallen asleep. These ones that the Thessalonians were worried about. He says, Jesus is going to come with them from heaven. And they're going to go, they're going to pick up their what? Their bodies. They will pick up their bodies. But one will say, what kind of body will they pick? The Bible tells us that the body sown in, sown in this honor will be raised in glory. Sown in weakness will be raised in power. So it's going to be glorified body, just like the body of Jesus Christ. He said this is what's going to happen first. And then secondly, then secondly says, we, Anyone who is a Christian alive at that point in time automatically will be changed. Their bodies will be glorified automatically. And remember that Jesus Christ is not coming down here on the earth. He's going to be in the air. That's why we're going to meet him. And when this happens, we all will go back to heaven. Then the tribulation, the 70 years, 70 years tribulation will start. Remember that the time of Israel is, is stopped right now, it's on, 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 on pause. Remember that 483 years already has been, have, have been completed. But the last 70 years is right now paused. And this time will resume after the rapture of the church. So seven years will go from the time of the rapture till the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because some people are confused. Some people think this is one and the same, which is completely wrong. 
The rapture of the church is Jesus Christ coming for his church, for the saints. He's not going to touch the ground on the earth. He's going to be in the air. So he gathers his own saints and he goes back to heaven. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is seven years after the rapture of the church. When Jesus Christ and us, everyone who is in heaven will be coming with him. Jude tells us, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. And the Bible says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, we will also appear with him. So we will be coming with him and he's going to He's, he's going to descend on Mount Zion. And the Bible tells us the mountain will split into two. He will take care of his enemies. And then he will make a judgment separating the sheep from the goats. Then he will start his 1,000 years on earth. Millennium reign on earth. This is the difference. So my friends... You may be going through some hard times right now, some difficulties. Perhaps you're going through some emotional problems. Or maybe the enemy has inflicted you with some disease or sickness. But whatever the problem is, remember that God is God. He says, call upon me and I will answer you. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything to have for me? Remember that God is always at the back. Behind the scene. And while he's there, he is moving everything that he's behind. It's only going to be a moment. For I reckon that the trials of this earth, this world, the tribulations, the, the persecutions, is not going to be worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us in a twinkle of an eye. He says, the trumpet will sound. He says, the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. And we all shall be changed. And this body, this corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. That day your problems will be over. Are you hearing me, my friends? It's not worth going through emotional stress and difficulties. The time comes. When these things will be over, there will no longer be persecution. The time comes. No longer needing or lacking anything. The time is coming. No longer infirmities or diseases. The time is coming. So I want you to comfort yourself with this. Knowing that Jesus Christ will, is coming back is imminent. Live a life that is separated unto God. For we need a with a twinkle of an eye, these things will be over. And all these troubles, these things that bother you, these things that make you miserable, these things that make you go into anxiety, worries, and distresses, they will be over. Have confidence and be strong. He that works, do not entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has called him to be a soldier. Be like what Paul said. This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. He says, I move forward. I, I, I go forward for the things which are before. And I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Be like Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. 
I have kept the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. The time is very short. Comfort one another, even yourself, with this. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I have come to the end of today's teaching. If you are under the sound of my voice, regardless of where you are this morning, hearing my voice is not an accident. If you are not born again or have not given your life to Christ Jesus, this is an opportunity for you to do so. There is no other way you can do it except from Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by Him. If you belong to any other religion and you believe that all roads lead to Christ, to God the Father, I am sorry to tell you that it's not so. It depends on God that you are talking about. If you are talking about God, the creator of heaven and the earth, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you are wrong. There is only one way that you can get to him. You cannot reject Jesus Christ and then you say, I have access to God. No, your self-righteousness, your good works, your efforts cannot get you to heaven. You can only come through Jesus Christ who paid the price. He became the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. He purchased the whole field that he may take out the treasure from it. So today is another opportunity. The day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't delay any longer. Do not say, let me go and get my acts together and I will come and I will praise God and, and I will become born again. You don't have the ability. You don't have such a time. The time is very short. Friends, just today alone, about 155,000 people died all over the world. Somewhere in the world. Where did they go? Remember, a man is a spirit. A spirit of a man will never die. He will live forever and ever. But the question is this. Where is he going to spend eternity? Is he going to be in heaven or in, on, in hell? For those who chose Jesus Christ when they were alive as the Lord and Savior will spend eternity in heaven. But anyone who's rejected him will not see heaven, but they will spend eternity in hell. It is a very simple decision to make. All you got to do is to believe with your heart. And receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and begin a new relationship with him. That's all it takes. You, haven't call, you, you are not called to do works. You are not called to come in through your human efforts or your self-righteousness. For the Bible says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the presence of God. He that believes in the Son, Son of God. Bible tells us that he has life. But he that believes not shall not see life. And the wrath of God abides in that one. For people are condemned for the simple reason that they did. They do not believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the reason why they are damned. The only reason why people go into hell. Because they refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. So I'm going to give you an opportunity now by praying with you. And if you pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart. Right now you will be recreated. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Pray this prayer. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that he is your son. He died for my own sins. You raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe right now that I am born again. My spirit is recreated. I am a child of God. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Father God, I give you all the glory for this. Friends, pray. if you pray that prayer, congratulations. You are now a child of God. And I will beseech you to look for a church where they teach the word of God and become a member of that church. 
buy a Bible, study the word of God. The only way that you can grow in your faith because you are now a spiritual baby is through the word of God. Peter says, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. Don't let Satan steal this from you. Remember, it is only those who hear the word of God and they put the word of God in practice. We call them the doers of the word of God. They are the only one who will get the benefits of the word of God. I want to use this opportunity thanking all our partners all over the world. Those that are helping us through their prayers, through their commitments, through their financial assistance to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ even to other people at no cost to them. If you would like to become a partner to this ministry, to this ministry, please go to our website. It is KUIM.org. I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and answer your prayers this day. And give you joy and peace, even in the midst of turmoil. And give you revelation knowledge, understanding of his word. And give you divine health and prosperity. And bless your week. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody say amen. Remember there is an end, friends. And your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Una gang radaska da pradeste kikuru prokutu, basha kala pradeste. Ana gang rendem pradeste ija kikuru prokutu, kikuru prokutu, Cheri era para mais junto para de que